The objective of this video is to describe what the Intel manual says about segment registers. And before I dive in, I just really want to emphasize that we no longer use segmented memory. What are we using instead? Well, we're using flat memory. So I'm not real sure how this section is going to go. But before I begin, I uh, figured I'll go ahead and let you know about that right away. So the segmented registers, these are their names. The first two just are easy to understand. You got a code segment and a data segment. They hold 16-bit segment selectors. So a segment selector is a special pointer that identifies a segment in memory. To access a particular segment in memory, the segment selector for that segment must be present in the appropriate uh, register. So the question could be, how do you access memory in a particular segment? Well, you use the appropriate segment register and the value of that register is actually the value of an address. So when I learned that, that was a real uh, big help for me. Now, when writing application code, programmers generally create segment selectors with assembler directives and symbols. The assembler and other tools then create the actual segment selector values associated with these directives and symbols. Okay, so that chunk right there really reminded me of what I was learning about the language Go because I guess you can have this uh, Go type of assembly. It's not like real assembly for a processor, but it's this language's assembly. I just heard about it on uh, Software Engineering Daily and maybe that's why when I read these uh, sentences thinking about programmers specifying this through their assembler directives. I was wondering if that relates. Well, the next part says that if writing system code, programmers may need to create segment selectors directly. Okay, so what would system code be? I wonder if that's like kernel coding or maybe operating system coding. Well, I guess those two might be the same thing. Oh, so that's a uh, just asking kind of question. I need a real answer to that. Now, how segment registers are used depends on the type of memory management model that the operating system or executive is using. And I just mentioned here that every time I see the word executive, I just keep thinking about like embedded systems, since embedded systems are not always um, using an operating system per se. Not an area of expertise for me, so be careful with that but at least I'm feeling comfortable about the concept of flat memory. I mean, at least flat memory we know is the opposite of segmenting memory. So I think all the data is just like all through the memory. You don't go to a particular segment to access something. I'm assuming you just follow the pointers and you get to where you need to be. And in essence, that's what an instruction pointer is. An instruction pointer has a value of an address where you're going to either call a function or return from a function. So with that in mind, when using the flat memory model, segment registers are loaded with segment selectors that point to overlapping segments, so each of which begins at address zero of the linear address space. These overlapping segments then comprise the linear address space for the program. So it says typically two overlapping segments are defined, one for code and another for data and stacks. The CS segment register points to the code segment and all the other segment registers point to the data and stack segment. Now I don't want to overhype this, but this next paragraph is really good. It says when using the segmented memory model, each segment register is ordinarily loaded with a different segment selector so that each segment selector, no segment register, points to a different segment within the linear address space. At any time, a program can thus access up to six segments in the linear address space. So I wrote what is the limit of segments in linear address space. It says to access a segment not pointed to by one of the segment registers, a program must first load the segment selector for the segment to be accessed into a segment register. So that paragraph just really helped me um, understand segmenting. Here's a nice picture for everybody to um, also better understand segmenting. Here's your registers. They are 16 bits, if I remember correctly. Okay, I had to go back up here. Yep, those are 16 bits right there. So 16 bits here. This whole idea of um, overlapping segments is confusing to me. So there's a good question to ask your professor. Can you better explain how segments overlap in address space? Let me know what they say. And here's a nice diagram of the use of segment registers in segmented memory model. 
And based on this, I came up with this like rule. Basically, if it's not a S or a C, then it's a data segment. C for code and S for stack. Now here's some keys to understanding. Each of the segment registers is associated with one of three types of storage, code, data, and stack, or stack. For example, this CS register contains the segment selector for the code segment, where the instructions being executed are stored. Underlined in yellow because it's so important, the processor fetches instructions from the code segment using a logical address that consists of the segment selector in the CS register and the contents of the EIP register. Remember, that's the instruction pointer. So where does the processor fetch instructions from? The answer is code segments, or the code segment. That is the value in the CS register. And then I'll type here, like, what is a logical address? Okay, maybe make that a just asking question in case I'm wrong. And then maybe a really good question, I feel like, which register is used in conjunction with the uh, CS, with the uh, code segment register? The answer is that instruction pointer. So the instruction pointer has the action that is about to be taken on the code that you could find in the code segment. Oh, I think if you really uh, flesh this out, that would be like very informative. But for the sake of these videos, let me just stick with the text. I am so tempted to go down a rabbit hole here, but I need to focus. So let's finish this up. The EIP register contains the offset within the code segment of the instruction to be executed. Oh, so I think like that kind of affirms what I was saying with that logical address right there. The logical address is the result of the code segment register and the EIP register. Now, the CS register cannot be loaded explicitly by an application program. Ooh, that sounds like a security thing. Instead, it is loaded implicitly by instructions or internal processor operations that can change from control, such as uh, procedures, calls, interrupt handling, or task switching. Oh, and so there's a good question. What are some examples of pro program control? Um, some examples include procedure calls, interrupt handling, or task switching. So now let's talk about the data registers. The DS, ES, FS, and GS registers point to four data segments. That makes sense if you have six total. Uh, two minus six is four. So the availability of four data segments permits sufficient and secure access to different types of data structures. I'm asking the question, like, how does that uh, relate to security? So there's a really funny uh, just asking kind of question, like, what was the thought process or what went into the choice to only allow uh, four data segments? Why not five or three? Might be a bad question, but asking it helps me remember. So it says, for example, four separate data segments might be created. One for the data structure of the current module, another for the data exported from a higher level module a third for a dynamically created data structure, and a fourth for data shared with another program. Okay, so that actually really did answer this. Let me delete that. That's a good question right there. So, to um, access additional data segments, the application program must load segment selectors for these segments into the DS, ES, FS, and GS registers as needed. Okay, it sounds like you could do um, more than four then. And that's what I was kind of writing right here in my bad handwriting, um, that you could have a segment register fetch another segment to <laughs> then fetch something that was um, a little confusing. I probably added confusion that you um, didn't need for that, so forgive me. Um, the SS register contains a segment selector for the stack segment where the procedure stack is stored for the program task or handler currently being executed. Never heard that term before, procedure stack, but I mean, I feel pretty comfortable with the concept of a stack as a data structure. It says here, all stack operations use the SS register to find the stack. To find the stack segment. So unlike the CS register, the SS register can be loaded explicitly, which permits application programs to set up multiple stacks and switch among them. So for me, um, the use of multiple stacks sounds like it could be kind of dangerous. You hear about buffer overflows. And when I just think about creating stacks or creating multiple data structures and sort of how difficult it is to visualize them, that's where I was struggling. I'm sure you guys are better natural programmers than I ever was.
So they tell us to uh, see another section called Memory Organization for an overview of how the segment registers are used in the real address mode. Oh, and this is the first time I noticed that they told us to go backwards. Yeah, sending me back now. Usually they send me forward. So here we are, 3.3 Memory Organization. Um, after reading all this, I mean, I have those videos up for you to see if uh, you want to flash from the past. But notice, I do kind of pick on this guy quite a bit. Uh, this real address mode is used for the Intel 8086 uh, processor. All because it's supposed to provide backwards compatibility. And to share a little something with you that I was reading earlier today, this is from um, Extreme Tech. It said that according to Samuel P. Morse, a guy who led the 8086 development effort, the new CPU was intended to be short-lived and not have many successors. Intel's original goal was to improve overall performance relative to previous products. And then you read that Morris, um, who had experience in software as well as hardware, he apparently in this historical retrospective made clear that he, if he had known he was inventing an architecture that would power computing for the next 40 years, right, this x86 architecture would be a very important for years and years to come says here that he would have done some things differently, including using a symmetric register structure and avoiding segmented addressing. All right, so he didn't want to go through segmented addressing, it looks like. Well, the last sentence of this section, section um, 3.4.2 on segment registers, the last part says, the four segment registers, CSDS, SS, and ES, are the same as the segment registers found in the Intel 8086 and the Intel 286 processors, and the FS and GS registers were introduced into the IA32 architecture with the Intel 386 family of processors. So I did some extra research on this, but I'm not going to share it with you just because the purpose of the video is to read the manual. I'll just end by saying that, uh, I wonder if I should go back and if it would be valuable for me to read the 8086 uh, manual specifically. I did make a video on reading the 8085 manual, well not reading it like I am here, but that 8085A was uh, pretty interesting, at least uh, to briefly flip through it was. So last question actually, uh, what did you learn about segment registers? Maybe just from the top of your head, finish off the video with that. Thank you for watching.